So let me make the argument for why screening matters. Because this is, again, kind of an area where I go far down a rabbit hole in a way that I think traditional medicine would argue against. So my argument for screening is an argument at the individual level. And it goes as follows. To my knowledge, there is not a single example of a cancer that is more effectively treated when the burden of cancer cells in the body is higher than when it is lower. Uh, so the two examples I think I talk about in the book are colon cancer and breast cancer. So when you take an individual with stage four colon cancer, that means that the cancer has left the colon and is now outside of the colon. So it's usually in the liver at a minimum, potentially in the lungs or in the brain. That person's five-year survival is very low. Their 10-year survival is zero. We will treat them with a very aggressive regimen of multiple drugs. And again, you'll get a five-year survival of, you know, maybe 10 to 20%. And by 10 years, nobody's alive. If you take a person with stage three colon cancer, so the colon cancer is big and it's even in the lymph nodes around the colon, but at least grossly, you can't see colon cancer cell. You can't see those cells in the liver. Microscopically, of course, we know they're there because if you don't treat those patients, they still die of colon cancer, but you whack them with the same chemo regimen that you are going to give the metastatic patients, 80% of those people are alive in five years. So night and day difference in survival. What's the difference? In the person with metastatic cancer, you're treating a person with hundreds of billions of cells. In the adjuvant setting, which is what we, we, call, we call it adjuvant when you treat people who have only microscopic disease, you're, you're treating billions of cells. The same is true with breast cancer. So we have the clinical trial data to put them side by side. So <clears throat> rule number one is don't get cancer. Rule number two is catch cancer as early as possible if you're going to get it. Which brings us to your question of how do you screen for it? Um, we basically screen, the first line of screening is, is imaging, is, 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 is a sort of visualization. So you have cancers that occur outside the body that you can look at directly. So skin cancer, you can look directly at the skin. Uh, esophageal, gastric, colon cancer, are, those are outside the body, right? Mouth to anus, embryologically is outside the body. So you can put a scope in and you can look directly at the cancer. But for all other cancers that are inside the body, yeah, you have to rely on some sort of imaging modality. Um, although now we're starting to look at things, things called liquid biopsies. So blood tests that are looking for cell-free DNA. And the cell-free DNA <clears throat> gives us a sense of, based on the epigenetic signature of what you're looking at, hey, is there a cancer in the body? And if so, what tissue is it potentially coming from based on these epigenetic signatures? So the problem with relying on any one modality is a, is a problem of sensitivity and specificity optimization. Now with MRI scanners, which are <clears throat> in some ways the best way to do this because they don't have radiation, so you don't want to be incurring damage as you do this. The irony of doing a whole body CT scan to screen for cancer is your, you know, a whole body CT scan would be close to, you know, 30 to 50 millisieverts of radiation. It's staggering sum of radiation. So does that um, mean that people should, uh, sorry to pull you off this, but um, I was going to ask about this anyway, uh, avoiding going through the whole body scanner at the airport. Um, noise, so low, so low. Yeah, uh, you know, going through a whole body scanner at the airport or even getting a DEXA scan. I mean, mm -hmm. these are trivial amounts of radiation. What about flying? You know, uh, you hear that you, pilots yeah, get, uh, more, uh, get more yeah, cancer. Pilots, kind of if you're a pilot who's flying over the North Pole, back and forth and back and forth, you're probably getting, you know, five to 10 millisieverts a year. The NRC suggests that nobody should get more than 50 millisieverts a year. So uh, you and I both travel a fair amount, uh, but typical travel for the busy person, to, let's say um, two round trip flights of uh, more than two hours per month and an international trip every three months. Um, probably still less than a millisievert a year. Uh, living at sea level, one millisievert a year. Living at a mile elevation. If you lived in Denver, you're at two millisieverts a year. Basically. I have to ask, standing in front of the microwave. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, well, we've got friends. They, they, they ask. And With like, or without testes on the counter? 
<laughs> That's an inside joke that uh, unfortunately and fortunately deserves no description. Um, and Peter's not referring to me. Um, but people worry about other sources of radiation. So it doesn't sound like the microwave is a concern. 